Nestling close to Ullswater in the Lake District is a lonely parish church. Inside is the only memorial to one of the worst naval disasters of the Second World War. A single stained glass window dedicated to the 1500 men who died when one of Britain's most valuable warships was sunk. But the episode is also one of the least known of the war. Few have even heard of the name of the ship. It's June 1940. Two German battlecruisers, Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, are heading out of the North Sea. Off the coast of Norway, they spot the aircraft carrier HMS Glorious and her two escort destroyers. The British ships are hopelessly outgunned. Within two hours, they've gone to the bottom. But why was Glorious there at all? Why did the Admiralty fail to pass on the warning they'd received about the German battle group? And why were 900 men left for three days to die in the water? We turned away from it all, which I think is, is a terrible thing to do. It grieves me to think about it. Many of the secrets of HMS Glorious lay hidden in the Admiralty files. The Navy's own inquiry told a story so embarrassing that its report was to be closed for a hundred years. Now, under pressure from relatives, the files have been opened. But they only emphasize the gap between the official version of what happened and the accounts of veterans we have traced who were there. Out from the hell that is Dunkirk, back from the steel thrust of the German war machine comes the BEF. It was early summer 1940. Britain was fighting for her life. The British expeditionary force was withdrawing in disarray from Dunkirk. The Germans had swept across the Low Countries and were pushing deep into France. To try to combat German landings in Norway, the War Cabinet had dispatched a task force. A mixed contingent of British and French were to be landed by the two navies. HMS Glorious joined them to ferry aircraft across the North Sea and to support the landings. She was one of three carriers assigned. New kinds of warfare mean new kinds of weapons and armaments. In this latest and greatest of all wars, the aircraft carrier is an indispensable unit of the modern fleet. It has eyes that range across hundreds of miles of sea. Bombers and torpedo bombers to act as long-range artillery before the ships attack. Glorious's captain was a former submariner named Guy Doyley Hughes, a much decorated hero of the First World War. His character and the way he ran the ship would be central to the whole tragedy. His daughter remembers how much the appointment meant to him. I think he was delighted because he'd been so keen on flying and he'd learnt to fly. He thought flying mattered. And it brought aeroplanes and the sea together in one command. Doyley Hughes was popular with his ship's company but his views about how aircraft should be used led to serious differences with his senior air staff. November 1939, there have been some very trying times with the man, but some fairly plain words have been spoken, and recently there has been a great improvement. I hope it'll last. 30th of November, I haven't had much trouble with our friend lately, mostly because I'm at some pains to keep out of his way. No doubt it'll be my turn again in due course. Tim Slesser's father, Lieutenant Commander Paul Slesser, was second in command of flying in the ship. His letters to his wife spoke of bitter divisions with the captain. He didn't seem when he arrived 
uh, sympathetic to their training. He, he, he was inclined to think it was a waste of time. He didn't believe in aerial reconnaissance, for example. I mean, I mean, they didn't feel he trusted them. And, you know, when that happens, it's difficult for them to trust him. The commander flying, J.B. Heath, faced particular criticism. I simply couldn't handle the situation as it was. That you were overruled, stamped on you, rudeness, total intolerance. And you were sin had the sensation of total lack of knowledge of, of air affairs. Can't explain it. He would have been impatient of anything, any lack of enthusiasm on, on their part. He was always impatient of lack of enthusiasm, I think. Lack of determination. A new pilot joined two months before the disaster and found himself in the middle of the feud. He was Petty Officer Dick Leggett. We were taken up to the bridge to meet the captain, Doyle Hughes. And he said, uh, well, I'm very pleased to see you. You'll be more used to me than those two over there. We thought it was he was making a bit of a joke. We suddenly saw the commander flying and lieutenant commander flying, J.B. Heath and Slessor, were both looking aghast. And we thought, oh, God, what's going on here? Early in June, a German battle group led by the pride of Hitler's navy, the pocket battleship Scharnhorst and Neisenau, left Kiel under the navy's leading admiral, Wilhelm Marschall. The German departure had not gone unnoticed by the British. The admiralty's failure to react was a fatal blunder. At Bletchley Park in Buckinghamshire, a small team of eavesdroppers was listening in to the German naval exchanges. They couldn't yet decipher messages, but were aware of a big increase in radio traffic. One of the early recruits at Bletchley Park was a 20-year-old Cambridge undergraduate, Harry Hinsley, a brilliant historian who now turned his mind to analysing German radio codes. I had a direct line to the admiral from Hut 4 in Bletchley. And I remember during that period, from about a fortnight before these ships moved, I pretty well rang the OIC, the Operational Intelligence Centre in the Admiralty, once or twice a day. And I said, look, you ought surely to pass a signal out on this. Can you possibly pass a signal out? But he said he couldn't persuade the bosses higher up to pass a signal. Back in Glorious, the row between the captain and his air staff had come to a head. The issue was over how to use the carrier's aircraft. She had only a third of her own contingent of swordfish and gladiators. In their place, she'd been ferrying a squadron of RAF Hurricanes to be based ashore in Norway. As the Navy pounded the enemy coastal positions, the British Commander-in-Chief called on Glorious to attack targets further inland. Yet she had barely enough aircraft to defend herself should any be freed for another mission. The captain wished to send aircraft ashore to help the army in view of CNC Northern Norway's signal. J.B. Heath said it was a misuse of naval aircraft. The captain insisted that arrangements should be made, and aircraft should be sent. J.B. Heath said no. After all, what could you do with five soldiers? And fuck all else. Do you do a bravado stuff with one of the few carriers? 
the two got in your fleet. Do you risk material and men for five poor old aircraft trying to bomb a target which they don't know even exists or where to find it and without any maps? I mean, the bloody thing with it was the most crazy heroics that you could think of. We felt that an effort should be made to try and do something to help the army. CNC had requested some help, he wasn't doing it idly. Agreed, we'd a very small number of aeroplanes, but an armed reconnaissance would have at least shown willing and could have been of some help. The captain moved immediately against his two air commanders. Back in Scarpa Flow, he had Heath put ashore under house arrest. Slesser was kept on board. Decisions that would have a critical bearing on the disaster about to unfold. Slesser wrote from the ship full of foreboding, his last letter before Glorious was lost. JB and I are in great trouble. I can't tell you the story, but you'll guess the cause of it. It was bound to come sooner or later, I suppose, and perhaps it's a good thing. I needn't tell you where right lies, nor that my conscience is absolutely clear, but we need your thoughts and prayers very much. Early in June, British attempts to maintain a foothold in Norway were finally abandoned. The Norwegian adventure had achieved virtually nothing. The Battle of Britain was about to begin. The 18,000 men of the task force were now urgently required at home. The Hurricanes, operating from their Norwegian airstrips, were a problem. It was too far for them to fly home. They'd have to be destroyed or land on a carrier, a feat never attempted by planes that fast, as their squadron leader was well aware. We hadn't got much choice, had we? Burn our precious hurricanes, I mean, you know. There's more than fish and bud could bear. And, uh, uh, well, the Battle of Britain started by this time, and we knew every, every aeroplane would be useful. The swordfish circled overhead. Jameson, my senior flight lieutenant, took the first three out, I took the next six. But the atmosphere was we were flying the aeroplanes for them. Up a bit, down a bit. Don't be a fool! Give it some throttle, you see. You're in the, around the uh, walkways aft on the ship. In fact, we didn't use the full length of the, the deck. We, were, we all stopped two-thirds of the way up, so it was no problem. With his ten hurricanes safely on board, Cross went up to the bridge to report to the captain. We were rather proud of ourselves, never having done it before. We thought we'd been rather smart, but uh, why did you take so long? He said. <laughs> that was our welcome from Doyle Hughes. Did you shake your hand? No, no, no. Oh, Chris, not Doyle Hughes. Within an hour, Gloria set off for home. It was to be her last voyage. She was leaving the safety of the other naval ships waiting off the Norwegian coast. They'd return in convoy, a matter of hours later. Gloria's had only two destroyers in support, less than half the escort for carriers laid down by the Admiralty. Her haste to get home is one of the continuing mysteries of the story. A parliamentary statement in 1946 said Glorious was sent ahead because she was short of fuel. But many believe that was a cover for a more embarrassing explanation. The head of the Naval Historical Branch today firmly supports the official version. Well, I believe it completely. She'd sailed eight days earlier. She was a very, very short-legged ship, now a short-ranged ship. Um, she'd been hanging around um, in the Narvik area unrefueled while she was there, she was going to be extremely short of fuel. 
Among the Admiralty files is another surprising suggestion as to why Glorious was allowed to sail ahead of the main convoy. Added to the official Board of Inquiry report in 1968 is a handwritten note. Commander Legate, captain of the destroyer Diana with the task force, had seen an Aldis lamp signal from Glorious to the flagship Ark Royal, giving a whole new perspective to the story. If Legate is right, Vice Admiral Wells on board Ark Royal was being asked to give Glorious permission to go home so Captain Doyley Hughes could put the final seal on the row with his air staff. I do not believe that um, if indeed there was a, an exchange of signals such as these that it materially affected Admiral Wells's judgment of when Glorious should go back. It may be an additional reason why Glorious wanted to go back, but that is not the underlying reason. Like she went home because she was short of fuel. Earlier logs of Glorious set out quite clearly her fuel consumption rates and give little support to the shortage of fuel argument. When Glorious left Scarpa Flow on the 31st of May, it's accepted she had full tanks of three and a half thousand tons. Sailing with Ark Royal, she did the 1,000-mile journey to Harstadt at 17 knots, as noted in Ark Royal's log. That used some 650 tons of fuel. For three days in the next six, at Admiral Wells' express order, Glorious was detached to conserve fuel. For the other three days, the two carriers kept together, averaging 15 knots, though faster when Glorious was flying aircraft on and off. But even deducting another 15% for error, Glorious would still have had at least 1,200 tons, more than enough to wait and return with the other ships. The arithmetic suggests she still had plenty of fuel. What do you mean by plenty of fuel? Enough to... So stay with the convoy? Yes. Again, I have not done that particular sum myself. How can you be so sure then that the, the Admiralty's arithmetic is correct? The Admiralty's arithmetic is correct. Because I, I'm satisfied, say from the length of time that she was away, and you take the endurance figures there, that there is no other, there's no other sensible explanation for it. Was it reasonable to let Glorious and just two destroyers go in order that the captain could, quote, expedite courts martial? I mean, that is extraordinary and it accounts frankly for why the Admiralty and the MOD since have always been so deeply embarrassed by the whole affair. But Legate says that request was made and that permission was granted. As I say it is Legate's word and something that he wrote 28 years after the event. I do not believe that too much credence should be placed in that particular note. That's the only source there is. There is no other source to collaborate with For whatever reason, HMS Glorious was allowed to sail ahead of the other ships. She was now heading for disaster. German battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Gneisenau were heading for the open sea. But the warnings of the one Englishman who knew they were there still went unheeded. From Kiel, the German battle group had sailed into the North Sea. Harry Hinsley's team tracked them all the way. The Admiralty put his reports in their daily log, but still refused to warn the fleet. By the 7th of June, the Germans were within the Arctic Circle, in the path of the retreating British. On that day, more so than ever, I was saying, for goodness sakes, can't you persuade them just to send an alert? Or even if it's only... It may be the case that, or, you know... He said, I can't, because first of all, my traffic analysis group don't agree with your interpretations. It doesn't 
doesn't see the point, doesn't see that there's any evidence for them. And secondly, my boss, the chief of the OIC, will not go to the operational chaps and say, say send this kind of signal out on your kind of information. Glorious was sailing south at 17 knots, fast enough to avoid submarine attack. She had no spotter planes in the air. They were being put below at 10 minutes' notice. The captain said there'd be no flying on the way back. And that flew in the face of all proper practice. The uh, personnel of the Swordfish Squadron, 823, started stowing torpedoes away. Now, a number of the aviators objected to this and said, look, that these should not be stowed away. And went over and asked the chief who was in charge of the little operation what was they were up to. He said, we're going to need a lap ahead for leave. The man in charge, the captain, was not an aviator. He'd sacked his aviator. To him, it was the ship. And the ship was on its way home. Whereas the, an aviator would have said, uh, yes, but the security of this ship depends on these damn little aeroplanes, and would have had a, a search out. Nick Barker's father was captain of HMS Ardent, one of the two escorting destroyers, and he went down with his ship trying to defend Glorious. Nick Barker himself became a distinguished captain in his own right, in the Falklands and elsewhere. He believes the lack of air cover was crucial. It was a very clear day, visibility maximum, and the aircraft would have had visibility, we'll say, out to 60 to 70 miles. Now, given that sort of range, um, the carrier and the two destroyers would have had a considerable speed distance advantage to go peeling off at high speed towards their destination. As it was, they had virtually no, no advantage. But would advance warning have saved Glorious? Yes, I think so. The last moments of Glorious were now to be recorded by a German propaganda news team on board the Scharnhorst. Inzwischen ist der englische Flugzeugträger Glorious gemeldet. Der 22.500 Tonnen große Koloss hat 48 Bombenflugzeuge an Bord. Mit äußerster Kraft geht es dem Feind entgegen, der durch Zerstörer gesichert wird. One of the first to sight Glorious was anti-aircraft spotter Willi Schulte. Ich stand oben am Formas, neben mir stand ein Kadett, ein junger Bursche, der hat als erstes diese Rauchfahnen am Horizont gesehen. Aber da habe ich sie auch gleich gesehen, der sagt, stand neben mir und sagt, eine Rauchfahne am Horizont. Und dann kam da langsam äh, ein Schiff zum Vorschein. Ich hatte ja auch noch nie ein, einen Flugzeugträger gesehen. Heute ist erkannt. Unsere Schlachtschiffe eröffnen das Feuer auf die Glorios. As I was having my tea, I saw through the portholes, splash, splash, splash. Pew. So I said to my messman, what the hell is that? Der erste Salbe vor dem äh, zu kurz war, die zweite Salbe war zu, zu weit und die dritte Salbe lag mitten auf dem, auf dem äh, Deck des äh, Schiffes, auf dem Fluchdeck. Und dann habe ich gesehen, dass da drei, vier Flugzeuge, die schon oben standen, aus über Bord gingen. Und dann war das für den natürlich schlecht, sie konnten da keine Flugzeuge mehr rausbringen. There was a rather large bang and then when I looked back, the aircraft had disappeared and so had the one next to it. And there was a large hole in the um, flight deck. Shell had gone right through and blown up inside the hangar and blown everything away. It was hardly a contest. The British ships were outgunned and outranged. 
die Didaktik war vielleicht insofern nicht so gut, nicht weil sie erstmal zu wenig Geschwindigkeit hatte, zu wenig Dampf, wie wir sagten, hatten und dann auch keinen von ihren Aufklärungsflugzeugen in der Luft hatte. Nicht? Und da war sie, sonst wäre sie bestimmt davon gelaufen. The first or second salvo hit the bridge. And I was told by one of the ship's officers that the captain had, had been killed. Less than two hours after the first sighting, the battle was over. The order was every man for himself, abandoned ship, so I did. I went up under the lower flying off deck, as I said. There was an officer there and he said to me, he said, go on, Chip, he said, get over the side. And I didn't need telling again, I was over. When I got into the water, I came up, I was in a cloud of steam from a broken pipe on the side of the ship. Uh, I was surrounded by nothing but corpses, uh, a lot of them being held up wrong end up by the um, knife belts, which were incorrectly positioned. Some 900 men were in the water. Over the next three days, all but 41 would perish. Could their deaths have been prevented? It's one of the most controversial questions in the whole story. The official account says no ship received an intelligible report of the action. But at 1620, minutes after the Germans were sighted, the telegraphist on Glorious did send a warning, an enemy report to the fleet. One man who heard the signal going out was a saltfish telegraphist in Glorious checking his aircraft radio. We traced Bob McBride to Victoria, Australia. It read um, two battleships bearing 310, um, eight miles distant. And uh, they were followed by a position. I know it was sent because I know I heard it. I read it, I understood it, and I recorded it. And there's no way that anybody can tell me it wasn't sent. Also heading home from Norway was the cruiser Devonshire. She carried a precious cargo, King Haakon of Norway and his entire cabinet. Devonshire was under orders from Churchill to safeguard her passengers and maintain strict radio silence. The official report says that at 1720, Devonshire picked up a garbled message from Glorious with no information about the position of the Germans. That's the version that's now being challenged. Petty officer Trevor Jenkins was the senior telegraphist on duty in Devonshire that day. He's always insisted that at 1620, he picked up the full enemy report of two PBs, two pocket battleships, which McBride had heard going out. I was in overall charge, you see, and uh, this operator of mine called me over and he said, listen, put the phones on, and I heard it, and the peculiar thing was that the Glorious used her peacetime call sign. This is how I knew it was the Glorious, and her call sign was WS. Uh, never forgotten it, and... Um, when I thought WS and then it was the old break you most immediate, I thought there's something coming. And then of course it was 2PB in the bearing. And then the speed of the, the enemy that she'd sighted and their course. And then of course the position. The signal was taken to both the captain of Devonshire, John Mansfield, and Vice Admiral John Cunningham, the senior officer on board. Watching was a young midshipman, David Corkhill. When the signal was handed in, it threw into the plot from the, the bridge wireless office, the officer in, who was on watch there 
transferred the position onto the chart and um, <clears throat> either the captain or the admiral looked at it and said, well, that's almost where we are, but uh, it obviously isn't here now or we can't see it or, or words to that effect. There's no report from the, the lookouts or anything that they could see anything, so we, we simply continued on our course. Trevor Jenkins couldn't believe that Devonshire was leaving Glorious to her fate. I knew the crew that was on board Glorious, it must have been literally at least a thousand men. And I thought to myself, well, you know, to, to turn away from, from it, we could have been in action. And, you know, it, it's something that I've experienced since during the war. You, you never abandon people when they're in the water, when they've been sunk. But at this stage, all you had was an enemy report. You, you yes. knew nothing about the action. No, but it was logical to assume that two pocket battleships were going to, when they were going to sink the Glorious. There, there was no doubt about it in my mind. The Admiralty say there's no evidence for Jenkins' allegations. Admiral Cunningham in Devonshire knew nothing of Glorious's plight. But Devonshire's log records that at 1625, five minutes after Jenkins noted his signal, the captain ordered exercise main armament, the first time they'd done so for four weeks. He must have received a signal which indicated to him that there was a threat, uh, a surface threat. Main armament of a cruiser are the big guns, and the big guns are used in a surface action, not against aircraft. They would have closed up at action stations. And he wouldn't have done that if he hadn't received a signal which indicated that there was a threat in the vicinity. I've never lied about it. It is an absolute fact that I read that enemy report and it wasn't garbled, it was made by a skilled operator. Could you have made a mistake? Oh no, I couldn't make a mistake like that. You must remember there was an operator who called my attention to it, plus the fact there was another operator in the main wireless office. Surely three operators couldn't make the same mistake, could they? We know not of, of this signal that um, it was repeatedly being received there. If it was uh, can be proved, yes, proved that it was received, then yes, there are questions to be asked, and you're, you're right to be asking them. Is the evidence of the chap who was there, who took the signal, not enough? Not unsupported. I wouldn't. I, I, I wouldn't believe that my parish priest, 48 years after the event suddenly coming forward with a, a statement. I would need something or other. It's too long after the event for, for human memories. Unsupported. That sounds to me and, uh, like a, a cover-up in, in hindsight because the, uh, there was no distortion or faintness or anything about that report, I'm sure of that. In 1988, Captain Harold Dean, a member of the Admiral's staff in Devonshire, remembered the dilemma the message created. Receipt of the intercepted emergency enemy report from Glorious posed a grave problem. On the one hand, orders to maintain wireless silence were explicit. On the other, was natural desire to do something. I recall the Admiral, slumped in the corner of the bridge, chain-smoking, and convinced that he would be condemned for turning his back on Glorious. Knowledge of the intercepted signal, wrote Dean, was restricted as far as possible, so as to avoid ill feeling among the ship's company. The flag lieutenant came into the remote control office and he said to me, the Admiral wants the remaining copy of the signal and the operator's log. So I said, all right, I got a new log out, and I wrote in the old log that 
this log has been handed over to Vice Admiral John Cunningham at his request and a new log has been handed over to the operator and I signed it and dated it. The original operator's log handed to Admiral Cunningham has never reappeared. He did break radio silence at two o'clock next morning to ask for a destroyer escort for King Hawken, but didn't mention Glorious until later, and then to say only that Devonshire had received a garbled report from the aircraft carrier. In 1946, the Labour MP Richard Stokes pressed the government for a public inquiry into the sinkings. An internal memo from R. R. Powell, head of military branch two, was dismissive. A full report at this date would make very dismal reading and would invite Mr. Stokes or other MPs to ask why this or that was not done. We turned away from it all, which I think is, is a terrible thing to do. It grieves me to think about it. bodies in the bottom of the lower raft because we hadn't got the strength to take them out and eventually we finished up with uh, four survivors out of something like 66. You look around and see one or two there and then after a little while you'll see one would drop off, drop off into the water and after another time another one would go and you see they start going like that and I thought, well, uh, it is my turn next, surely, because I was 28 years old and all the young ones had gone, the youngsters, they seemed to be the first ones to go. The chap alongside me, who'd swum just a moment before from another car, was hanging on to a piece of uh, rope, and I said, are you all right? And he said, yeah, with that, died. Very peaceful death, a very easy way to die. Hmm. Most peaceful. Most of them put a hand up like that. Large number of them. And then said goodbye. Hmm. 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 Yeah. German ships did not escape unscathed. Just before Acasta, Glorious's second escort destroyer, sank, she scored a direct hit on Scharnhorst with a torpedo. The ganze Format so gerumpelt, dass ich dachte, er bricht ab, ne? Und dann da legte sich das Schiff auf der Steuerbordseite, dass ich äh, auf allen Vieren auf die Backbordseite gekrochen bin. Also so weit hat er sich oben rüber gelegt. Das war natürlich für uns ein großer Schreck und. Äh, so was hatte ich auch noch nicht erlebt. Every year the veterans of Scharnhorst and Neisenau gather to remember wartime exploits. They also remember the 53 of their shipmates who were killed by the single torpedo that hit Scharnhorst. The British have never acknowledged the courage of their two destroyers. But the Germans are still full of praise for the way Acasta and Ardent tried to protect the mothership. Die haben die so eingenebelt, die wollten sie sich schützen. Und dann brachen sie bloß immer hin und zu mal durch. Man sah, der Bug kommt raus, ah, weg, weg waren sie wieder. 
Wir konnten noch nicht mal schießen. So schnell ging das. Ja, ich war an Oberdeck und sah den Zerstörer Arend fliegen, ohne Fahrt, starke Rauchentwicklung. Und da hat er geschossen und gekämpft bis zuletzt. Und das hat uns ganz gewaltig imponiert. Da konnte man echte Seefahrt sehen. Das war einmalig. So etwas hat es noch nie gegeben. So ein Kampf wie die um die Gläuses gekämpft haben. Eben dieser Marschall hat er wie die beiden Zerstörer gesunken sind. Die Flagge auf Altmaß und die ganze Brücke. Achtung. Zwischen ja. der Tapferkeit der englischen Seeleute. Ja. Ja. When we first went in the water, the people with us said to me, um, what do you think about our chances? And I said, well, somebody will be, should, be, should be here within eight hours, reconnaissance, airplanes, and 16 hours, a destroyer, something like that. And then after about eight hours, three or four of the chaps who are still alive said, it's a bloody long eight hours, isn't it? Thirst was, our, was everybody's problem. Uh, I had a, a bone colour stud and I thought I would suck that and see if it would uh, help. And it did a little. Uh, by this time the sea was dead calm and, um, and you could see fathoms downwards. And I was leaning forward, looking down like that, and let it fall out of my mouth. And I saw it going down fathom after fathom, my white, white uh, stud. And of course I let out an oath, which woke all the others up. And, and what's, the, what's the matter, what's, that, what's happened? And I said, I've, I've dropped my stud. And the old warrant officer looked at me and said, I shouldn't worry, sir, they don't mind how you're dressed on these occasions. <laughs> The Admiralty only learned of the sinking of Glorious from a German radio broadcast almost 24 hours after the event. The British ships in the area launched a search but had no precise information as to where to look. Well, I'd seen one walrus pass over us and taken off me May West and waved it valiantly. They didn't see us and we could have done even with a little bit of tin to flash, but we had nothing at all. No water, no food, and no um, rockets, no port fires, which was the standard uh, equipment for this sort of thing. The Navy never did find them. The survivors were picked up by a Norwegian trawler after three days and three nights adrift. And uh, we had no idea of the passage of time. And suddenly, one of the sailors said, there's a ship. And there it was on the, oh, not, not many miles away either. We scrambled up the knitting and um, uh, then I went down into a sort of coke hole place I found for myself because I was very, very close to finish. And I just lay there until we got to uh, the Faroe Islands. 1,519 officers and men had died, 41 survived. In Trondheim, the Germans celebrated the fall of Norway. But Admiral Marshall wasn't present. He was sacked for risking his ships and for using too much ammunition against Glorious and the destroyers. The court-martial of J.B. Heath never took place, but the Navy kept him out of the way with a series of postings to distant parts. The captains of Ardent and Acasta, Ben Barker and Charles Glassford were recommended for VCs but turned down, receiving only a mention in dispatches. Admiral Sir John Cunningham was awarded the Grand Cross and Star of the Royal Norwegian Order of St. Olaf for bringing King Haakon to London. 
Churchill also wrote to congratulate him. Trevor Jenkins was surprised one day to be sent for by his captain in Devonshire, John Mansfield. The tragic events of the 8th of June, he said, is still uppermost in your mind, I expect. I said, yes, sir. So he said, I don't believe that story that you read a garbled signal. I said, thank you, sir. I said it was the truth. I said I wrote it down as I received it. He said, well, he said, I've always had good reports about you. He said, excellent reports, really. And he said, I don't doubt your word. He said, and I believe you. Harry Hinsley, the Cambridge undergraduate whose advice had been ignored by the Admiralty, became Britain's top codebreaker. He led the team that broke the German Enigma code. Later, Professor Sir Harry Hinsley became Principal of St John's College, Cambridge, and Vice-Chancellor of the University. For him, it all started with Glorious. They began to realise that, in spite of the fact that we were scruffy and young and civilian, we had something to contribute. But they took great pains thereafter, always to be in close touch and always to argue and listen to us. Taking the trouble to have me down in the Admiralty, up in the home fleet, taking the trouble to appoint a liaison officer to Bletchley, with whom we could always argue and show the facts. So relations ever after the Glorious were admirable. In 1945, Joe Brown, ship's joiner, finally came home. He'd also been picked up by a Norwegian boat, but spent five years as a prisoner of war. He took the train to Plymouth and reported to the duty officer at Devonport. He said, when was he last home? So I said, uh, 1938, January 1938. He said, I'll send you home to me. And the same lorry took me home to Orrabridge here, down here. It was round about two o'clock and uh, the fellow knocked on the door and, and uh, my sister wondered what was up happening and she poked her head out the window and, what's the matter? Oh, he said, I got your brother here. He said, She said, your brother? She said, he's in Germany. He said, no, he isn't. He's here. And then I went in. And that was my, my own coming. Earlier this year, Earl Howe, Parliamentary Under Secretary for Defence, wrote two letters to the Liberal Democrat MP, Alan Peath, about the glorious affair, repeating many of the familiar phrases of the official version dating back 50 years. British intelligence sources had failed to discover that the German force had sailed. Glorious had been detached from HMS Ark Royal's force because she was short of fuel. A garbled and almost unintelligible report was received by Devonshire at 1720. If you make a major cock-up, and, and we did make a major cock-up, and we made a number of subsidiary cock-ups that we really don't want to air, the, air that dirty washing for as long as possible, and preferably beyond the lives of those who might have had anything to do with it. And that's what you think has happened? And that's what I think has happened. While we were making this film, Captain Nick Barker died in Northumberland of cancer. 
So too did Lieutenant Commander Bob McBride in Wonthaggi, Australia. <laughs> 